Well, thank you very much, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, the invitation and giving me the opportunity to to speak. And uh, I have to apologize at the very beginning because um, I'm kind of in the middle of a of a huge project and. Um, there are th some new things that I can present, but uh, not the things I would like to. Um, so, um, but I would like to raise some awareness for um, for the for the problem I'm working on. So, um, this is a very I'm interested in in a very um, classical uh, problem, namely the um, characters of um, algebraic groups in positive characteristic. Um, so let me just state the um, state um, the the problem. So G is a reductive algebraic group, over over field um, K, and uh, let's fix the usual um, data. So Borel and maximal torus. So and this gives us. Um, the set of dominant weights. So these are the characters of the torus. And um, it's a very well um, established result that probably you all know um, that um, the uh, simple representations um, are parametrized by um, the highest weight. And this is a dominant um, weight. Um, So L lambda is the uh, simple representation. So one of the remarkable things is that X, in some sense, is independent of the uh, um, of the field. So it's always um, a lattice of um, R, the rank of um, of G, and um, so we can view um, lambda as an um, something that is independent of of the field. And uh, but of course L lambda is not. Um, and so what I want to understand um, is, is the character of a lambda. Um, so just a formal sum, or it's not really a formal sum, it's really a sum in a, um, in a group um, ring, of the dimensions, so the k dimensions of the mu weight space. So um, this is the mu weight space. That's the problem. I want to understand this. Uh, I think almost all of you know a lot about this, and maybe um, also of the uh, recent uh, developments in this area, which are quite um, astonishing. Um, well, let me start with um, with the most um, classical case, just as um, as a reminder. So, if uh, the characteristic of k is zero. Um, then this was solved um, by by Weil. So there's the Weil's character formula. <coughs> the Weil's character formula says the following. So here um, W. Yeah, W. Is the, um, is the finite Weil group and rho is rho. So the half sum of positive roots. So these are the positive roots. Um, so this is a very beautiful and concise uh, formula. Um, and um, so it would be great to have something like this formula also uh, for arbitrary k, but we are far from from anything um, like that. So um, the, um, the situation in positive characteristic is um, drastically different. Um, and um, I would say most of most of the, the results that we that we actually want to establish are not yet known. So what is known is the, is the following. So suppose uh, the characteristic of k is, um, is p. Um, 
<coughs> then, um, yeah, you see, one of the, the things in this, in this theory is that, uh, you know, I needed five lines, of course, assuming a lot of stuff before, to, to just state a wise character formula. But now, to state what is known in positive characteristic, I have to work quite hard. I have to introduce a lot of new notation. Um, and this already gives you gives you a hint that that things get get a little messy and um, are not really well understood. So um, there's um, there's Lustig's character formula, and um, it states um, the following. So um, first of all, um, you might know that one can rewrite. Um, the character formula of um, of while, think of the associated Lie algebra in characteristic zero here, as an alternating sum, a weighted sum, not in this case, of um, of the characters of Velma modules. Um, so you don't have to divide by anything, um, and um, so. Um, that's due to Kostand, and he ex uh, expressed the uh, simple characters in terms of the Velma characters, which are, of course, easy to determine. <laughs> and um, Lustig, um, Lustig's formula uh, does something uh, similar. Um, so um, we can express the simple characters, um, I mean, this is um, an easy result, as um, a weighted sum of the characters of the standard modules in this theory. So these are the Weil modules. Um, let me write the Weil module um, as, um, as follows. So it's actually the, um, the space of sections of a line bundle on the flag variety. So it's H0 of a line bundle. H0 mu, so is, uh, I should say it's, it's a dual Weil module, I guess. But um, since this has a kind of easy uh, geometric construction, um, its character is known. Oh, well, it's, it's actually this character. Uh, so the character is known, known. So this is given, the character is given by, by its formula. So the problem now um, means we have, to, we have to understand uh, um, these numbers, lambda mu, and we um, can't expect that they are positive. They, they will certainly be uh, um, positive or negative or so. So uh, the linkage principle um, already tells you that many of these numbers are 0. So um, n lambda mu is 0 unless um, Lambda and mu are contained in the same uh, orbit under the affine Weyl group. Whoop, sorry. Um, and um, the affine Weyl group, well, you know the affine Weyl group, it acts on x, but in a p dilated uh, way. So um, you should <coughs> think of w hat as the, um, as the reflection uh, group of reflections in this lattice on these um, translated hyperplanes, but the distance here, so this is the hyperplane, say alpha check equals zero, so this is the linear hyperplane, and here you have the hyperplane alpha check equals p. So, um, <coughs> so the, the weight lattice is somehow, depending on p, you have more or less weight in each of uh, these alcoves. Um, so this is a group um, that determines this linkage principle, and um, so many of these n lambda mu's are zero. And now Lustig's, um, Lustig's formula uh, says the following: that um, n w dot zero x dot um, zero is a minus one. So here's a, here's the sign. Um, times a Kastanussi polynomial. Um, sorry. <coughs> Evaluated at one, and this is an affine Kastanussi polynomial. So the uh, the Kastanussi polynomial associated to the affine Weyl group, affine Kastanussi polynomial uh, evaluated um, at one. 
Um, well, that, um, that is, is nice so far, but uh, this formula holds only if w dot zero, let me see if I got this correct, yeah, if w zero is, is restricted. i.e. w0 is contained in the following set that's is usually called x1 plus this is the uh, set of all um, all weights um, such that 0 is smaller or equal to uh, mu evaluated at alpha check this is smaller than p uh, for all simple roots so um, so um, it has to be on the on the lower side of all simple reflection hyperplane, um, you know, at that is translated once. So this is the set of restricted weights <laughs> for for SL three. Um, so this formula <coughs> is 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 quite nice. Um, um, it's very precise, and I mean, um, you, you, you do expect that these, these numbers are different from one, and here it says, well, it's just a polynomial evaluated at one. This is just very similar or analogous to the uh, characteristic zero situation in the um, category O. Uh, so this is a nice formula, but it, it was conjectured only if W0 is um, Restricted. Oh, and I forget. And so W zero also so W zero sh should also be regular. And regular with respect to the action of the um, of the affine uh, Weyl group uh, with a dot action. So it's translated by um, by minus a rho. And uh, so this is. Um, this w0 is regular. This just means, I mean, for the weights that are restricted, this implies that this formula only makes sense if the, um, if the prime is bigger or equal to the Coxeter number. Because otherwise, you don't have any, um, any regular weight. You, you can see you, if, if p gets smaller, then one point you might come to a situation where you just don't have an <laughs> integral point in, in, this, um, in, in any of these arc inside in a interior of one alcove. Uh, OK, so um, Lustig conjectured um, this formula with, with this. Now, well, OK, he, he's, he conjectured is for p bigger or equal to 2h minus 2 for, for some reasons. But um, um, morally, um, I mean, it turned out later that um, so this formula at least makes sense for p is regular. but uh, as you probably all know, um, this is a far too optimistic bound. And um, I guess George Lustig knew that once he published this article, because he never repeated. So in the original article, he, he gave this bound. But uh, in all subsequent articles, um, he wrote something like, for p big enough. Um, and this was then proven for, for p big enough by um, in a <coughs> wonderful and super long proof using geometry of affine flag manifolds and um, tensor products, fusion products on, um, um, on representations, integral representations, affine cuts moody algebras, and um, then the um, base change arguments of Anders and Jansen and Zirkel. It's very difficult, very involved, but it turned out that this is true for p big enough. So when this for, was first um, proven in, um, in the early 90s, um, people didn't know what p big enough um, actually means. So for any specific prime, they couldn't say what uh, p big enough um, means. And so um, um, I later I gave kind of different um, uh, proof of this result. And um, I could give an. Um, uh, a lower bound for uh, for these, or an upper bound for the exceptional primes, let's say. Um, but this turned out, I mean, it's it's a little involved. Um, but to give you an idea how um, uh, how big this prime is, um, so so I proved that uh, the, the formula is true 
for p bigger than so a number that grows roughly like the Coxeter number um, to the exponent two, um, two to the Coxeter number. Uh, so this is a huge number. Um, well it's very far from the Coxeter number, anyways, and um, so um, people still people like like me still tried to. Um, to get down to a more uh, serious bound. So my, um, my approach here, it was, was kind of clear that it couldn't get much better. Uh, and then Jordi Williamson um, came up with a, a series of counterexamples. Actually, he, he developed a machinery producing counterexamples to, um, to this um, conjecture for um, primes below this, uh, this bound, but bigger than the Coxeter number. And you could actually prove that the real bound um, has to grow at least exponentially in, in the Coxeter number. Um, so that was the situation like four or five years ago. And um, yeah, we had to cope with this. I mean, everyone who was interested in this particular problem, had to cope with this um, this new information, and of course, there's two ways to think about it. I mean, you can despair and say, "Well, oh, that's," um, I mean, all you know, all the all the methods that we developed try to pr you know try to prove that p is um, that this is the right bound. Um, count examples were not known, um, and now uh, we know. Well, the <laughs> real bound grows exponentially, and you could. You could just throw away all these methods, um, you know, because um, you had to start over. Um, and and worse, um, we didn't have any any new formula. So if if this formula is not true for um, for p um, between these two be to, between do these two numbers, so which formula is true? <coughs> so how can we replace this formula? Well, uh, and still today people don't know. Um, and um, the, 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 so the, uh, the, in the last couple of years, the, the situation got, I, I think, more and more interesting, because we, we kind of realized that, that there's something going on that needs new, new ideas. Um, um, so yeah, so you could either despair and say, well, the, the character formula is just what it is. I mean, maybe there is no formula. Maybe there is no reasonable way to, to calculate this. I mean, the character is well defined, right? And what does it mean to want to know what the character is? Um, <laughs> Sounds like a real crisis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but you know, in a, in a kind of positive sense, it's, 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 a, it's a question that can actually push you towards a solution. And I thought about this a lot. So, um, where um, you know, where are we satisfied um, with with a solution? So there's um, there is an uh, there is a new approach. Let me um, just um, Wait, can I ask, what, what is sure. the zero here? I, I was confused. W Which X times zero? Oh, that's the zero weight. So W dot zero. That's the uh, row shifted action. Okay. Um, so uh, that's the. Zero is you only want to start with the zero. Ah, yeah, th I haven't said that. Um, yes, I want to start with um, only the zero. So zero is um, is is a weight, uh, the lowest weight in the ah. in the fundamental alcove, and the orbit, you know, um, the orbit of this zero. Um, so why you only want to use that? One? Because it's enough. Because um, ah. so you can actually replace zero by any weight in the in the fundamental alcove, uh, but using translation functors, uh, it's actually enough. To know what uh, what these numbers are, okay. so um, yeah, that's yeah, that's a, it's a so yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. I forgot to um, forgot to mention that, and I got the orbit wrong here. So <laughs> anyways, Sorry. so uh, you take you take one uh, weight in the fundamental argument. Doesn't matter what which it is, but okay. zero is a good, <coughs> good choice. So um, let W times zero is strictly just mean that W is identity. No, no. Look, a uh, restricted ways. So for SL three, it would mean W dot zero is zero. So W is the identity, or the, or it's this uh, affine reflection. Oh. So for SL three, there's um, there's only two two weights for which um, this formula states anything. Mm. 
Ah, right. I was too quick. Um, I think I promised I finish in time. And <laughs> so um, what I also should say, so even th though these are restricted, it, it is known how to calculate all the characters from these restricted weights using Steinberg's tensor product formula. So if P is bigger than the Coxeter number, it's actually enough to, to know these weights. Um, right. So uh, thank you very much. I was really skipping over a couple of things that, that were important for me here. Um, <coughs> okay. It's enough to know these restricted weights, and there's a formula. And from <coughs> these, you can calculate all the weights. Um, but there's also something going on here. Um, it would be nicer. Um, to have a formula that just you, you can just write down for any weight. I mean, saying it's enough to know these and then using Steinberg's tensor product formula is, is absolutely correct, but it would be nicer to have a, a formula which just, you know, you just plug in lambda and, and, and yeah, you just plug in lambda and you get something, right? Um, but we are far from anything like, like this. According to that picture, it looks like that you're above the alpha check equals D line. And the, and the yeah, because alpha, <laughs> in this picture, alpha is not a simple root. Ah, okay. Right. For all alpha simple. Sorry, okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <coughs> so here, look, these, this and this are the, um, the hyperplanes okay. for the simple roots. So, um, so I want to just quickly um, tell you what, what happened in the last two or three years in the work of Jordi Williamson, Simon Risch, Pramoda Cha, and Shotari Makisumi. Um, they uh, kind of approached this uh, problem from a different uh, but very interesting perspective. So there's another a set of um, modules that are very interesting, representations that are very interesting for the group, namely the tilting module. So, uh, by the way, uh, Williamson and Rich's book can be purchased for half price. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> if you want to know, you want to know more? <laughs> Only today. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a tilting module. So what is a tilting module? You've seen these uh, dual Y modules, H0 um, mu, and the tilting module is something that on the first, um, the first look doesn't, looks, looks a little um, artificial. Namely, it's a module that has a filtration that uh, where the subquotients are isomorphic to tilting modules, um, and it has a different filtration where the subquotients are isomorphic to dual tilting modules. Uh, two dual vi mo so vi modules and dual vi modules. You can also say this module and the dual module have both have a filtration where the subquotients are vi modules. Um, and it's indecomposable. And there's a theorem that for any dominant weight, um, there's an indecomposable uh, tilting module. I, a little, uh, I, I write with highest weight lambda, which means that lambda is a maximal weight in its um, in the set of its weights, but it doesn't mean that it's generated by this, by this weight. Does tilting also mean it's self x by zero? Yeah, anything? to the higher x star. Yeah. Uh, actually, all the higher x between tilting modules are uh, vanish. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, class of modules, and uh, we can ask the same question. So um, what is the character of this tilting module? Um, or equivalently, what is the multiplicity so it has a filtration by these Y modules. Um, so the characters of these Y modules, as I said before, are very well known because they have a really nice geometric origin. Um, so this is the multiplicity. Um, so what is this multiplicity? Um, <coughs> and this situation is even worse than the character situation. Because up to today, there's not a formula for SL3 for, for this. So uh, not a real, so no one really knows what's going on for SL3. Um, 
so, um, but let me know, uh, let, let, me <laughs> let me say what is known. So, um, there's the following approach of, um, um, of Jordi and um, Promote and um, Simon and uh, Maki. So, um, there's, there's wall crossing functors. So, let's first say rep 0g is the, uh, the block of the rep uh, representations of g um, that contains the trivial representation. Then um, Janssen constructed for any simple reflection, uh, let's say S, so a simple <coughs> affine, um, maybe I should put a hat here, um, reflection. He constructed um, wall crossing functors. So this is a wall crossing functor, exact functor. Um, uh, and it's, um, this preserves tilting modules preserves direct sum of tilting modules, not tilting modules, I mean, not the decomposable ones, unfortunately. Um, so, and, um, right, so uh, for any simple reflection, simple affine reflection, you have this functor acting in this uh, category. And uh, it preserves uh, direct sum of tilting modules, which means if you if you apply it to a tilting module, you get a direct sum of tilting modules. So if you knew how this direct sum would split, you could deduce the multiplicity because um, it is known what these tilting modules do uh, in terms of these multiplicities. I don't want to be too precise here, but um, the problem now. <coughs> that would determine this multiplicity uh, is decompose theta s t, so um, tw dot zero. Mm -hmm. So the, the tilting modules in this, um, in this category are parameterized by these weights again. Um, so decompose uh, these. Uh, so, and um, I know that, um, jo Jordi was um, thinking about this uh, a long time ago, and I think um, the idea that that they, um, the authors followed actually might uh, go back to Raphael Rouquier, who um, who had the idea of defining categories, monoidal categories by generators and relations. I think Jordi very often refers this to uh, as an idea that came from you and then from Nikola Libedinsky and so. So, um, so what they did, they um, looked at this category. Um, so this is a mon so um, these are functors. So um, these functors act on this category, and so the theta s they generate a subcategory in the category of functors of endo functors on this um, on this um, category, and they can be composed. So it's a monoidal category. And um, they describe this category by um, generators and relations using diagram diagrammatics. And um, so, um, right. Let me let me speed up things here a little. So their their result is um, the this is just a direct sum of the other tilting. Yes. Yes, exactly. So this is a, yeah, this is a direct sum of other tilting modules, and um, right. So um, the diagrammatic um, Hecke category um, of um, Williamson and Ben Elias is uh, generated by objects. BS, so it's a monoidal category. So monoidally generated by objects BS, S, M, L, M, and S, and then there's um, very many. So it's graded, um, and it's um, idempotent complete. That means you can, if you have an idempotent in an anamorphism ring, you can actually decompose the the objects. Um, it's um, uh, 
what do we want to say? Yeah, it's k linear and uh, it can be actually defined over the, the integers. Maybe you have to sometimes in word um, two, um, but it really has a kind of integral structure. Um, and there, there are some relations. Uh, actually, there's a very many relations that are kind of diagrams. It tells you how to transform one diagram into another. It's really quite technical and complicated, um, but um, there's the following uh, result. So let's call this category, I want to stick to their notation, D for diagrams, I guess. Um, so the theorem, um, so the indecomposables um, in D, they are in bijection with um, <coughs> the affine Weyl group um, across the integers. It's graded, so you have an integer. Um, so this is a, um, um, this is called B, let's see, BW shifted um, by N. And um, so there's a way to associate the character um, um, to, um, to objects um, <coughs> associate the character. So it's, this is mainly taking homs between um, certain of these, um, of these uh, BWs. Um, and uh, so it makes sense, let me just say this, it makes sense to write a character of um, BW and the result, um, the result of Jordi and co-authors is, um, is the following. Um, so this monoidal category acts on rep zero G um, in such a way that these generators Bs, they go to the wall crossing functors, theta s, um, and this Bw, um, so I mean this is, um, this is independent of the grading is, is, I mean, you have to degrade uh, first. So let me, um, um, let me write it um, differently. So this in, induces an isomorphism between a quotient of this category, namely all, uh, you quotient out all morphisms, um, um, that factor over direct sum of BW ends where W is not, uh, not maximal in its finite um, W orbit, so a finite um, Weyl group orbit, then this gives an iso um, isomorphism to the category of, uh, equivalence to the category of tilting modules in Reb G and the character of BW um, is the character, well, it the, gives the multiplicity of uh, TW dot zero. Um, yeah, well, um, Jordi and Simon Risch in their first paper, they proved it for GLN, um, but then later it was proven by Pramod and Maki and Jordi and Simon in all types. Uh, yeah, so when I, 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 well, I forgot to say that, well, they, they specify the, the morphisms here, of course, and then they divide out by relations of the morphisms. And certain morphisms here you uh, factor out and you get um, a category that is um, equivalent to these tilting modules. And um, so here now you can, um, you have a new um, way to approach this tilting module character. And these characters here, they are by definition, they are the, um, the p can so the, these are given by the p-canonical basis of Williamson, Elias Williamson. So 
so uh, these are actually elements in the hacker algebra. So in the, in the usual affine hacker algebra that you, um, that you all know, uh, it's, um, it's an analog of the Kastanusik basis, but it's, um, it's a p-analog. And the, uh, there is an algorithm that uh, constructs these p um, canonical basis elements. It's very similar to the um, Kastanusik algorithm, but uh, it involves also um, an inter so-called intersection form. So that's an integral um, form, and um, so you know, the, the, I mean you have to uh, reduce this mod p and then look at its rank, and uh, this helps you to um, calculate the um, to to change the Kastan-Lustig algorithm, and you obtain a p canonical basis. Uh, Right, so what is the time right now? 9.40. Oh yeah, okay, okay. So then I don't talk much more about this. Um, so just recently I read an article. Um, ah, <laughs> um, one, one last thing. Um, so why is that important? So uh, why are these tilting characters as difficult as they are? Why are they important for our original problem? Well, it is known how to um, get the character of all simple representations from these multiplicities, but not the other way around. So this is a seemingly harder problem, but it implies the character formulas for the simple module. So this is enough to know uh, to solve our, um, our character problem. Um, so I, I read recently an article and stated in the, in, the, um, in the introduction, it said something like, referring to this result, now that the formula for tilting modules is known, um, we go on and and um, I, I, it's come, it kind of heard that in some discussions with with colleagues that well now this is isn't it the end of modular <laughs> yeah it's not that's not what I think I mean this this p canonical basis is I mean it can be calculated Jordi did computer calculations. And it gives you, I mean, computer gives you numbers, um, but it's not, that's not yet what you, what you want. This intersection form is really difficult to calculate. And also these computer programs, they mainly work for SL3. Um, and I, I do think Jordi and co-authors would kind of agree that this cannot be the end of, of the character problem. Um, especially because, um, things are still extremely difficult and extremely uh, mysterious. So there's another idea of George Lustig um, towards a character formula for simple representation and tilting modules. And what George Lustig um, ad advocates is that um, a character formula or a multiplicity formula should uh, come in generations. So, um, very roughly, I won't be precise, but um, there should be a zeroth character, which is more or less vice character formula for the simple representation. Then there should be one, a one generation character, then a two generation character, and each, the nth generation character you should, should be able to express as a sum of n minus one generation characters. And it should converge to the, to the final character. Um, so it's not, not what much is known, I think, about this, this generation property. And one problem is that you cannot associate any objects to an ith generation character. You just, you know, you just have at an infinity, you have the tilting module, for example. But in between, it's not clear what, if there's an object corresponding to this ith generation. And it's also very difficult to, um, to calculate. Okay, um, so Jordi made a very funny video. So just to relax a little, I show you a small video. Um, <laughs> Jordi, that's, that's due to Jordi. He uh, calculated the, uh, I think there's no, no, there's no light. I better not do anything. Ah. 
And this uh, video came out of um, calculations for the second generation characters for SL3. They are not, so these characters for SL3 are not known, still not known. Um, they can be calculated up to a certain point, but what you see now is, is a kind of um, combinatorics, which is rather involved, really difficult, that goes into the calculation of second generation um, characters for SL3, not the final character, but only the second generation. So this is SL3 and, and the prime number is, um, is seven. So let me, let me start this. And um, so um, it's the billiard conjecture of Jordi and, and George Lustig. Um, in order to, to calculate characters, you have to apply this funny billiard um, um, at, the, at the walls of, um, of alcoves. Um, and um, <laughs> I cannot really explain the meaning um, of, of, these, um, of these dots, but um, roughly that's where um, you know, multiplicities um, happen. So this, 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 one, this one dot that um, goes up on this line, this is the highest weight. This is the lambda, and there is the muse where the, um, the characters appear. And you see there's something going on that um, is not, not really chaotic, but very beautiful. Well, <laughs> 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 I, I pass the word over to Jordi. <laughs> For the, the last 10 minutes. <laughs> OK, OK, thank you, yeah. So <laughs> Well, this is a Serre quotient. Right. So, um, what is the quotient? What is the W not maximal in condition? Ah, yeah. So you see, so this is, um, I, I was much too imprecise, but the, um, the, these objects here, the indecomposables, are um, um, parameterized by the affine Weyl group. Right. But the tilting modules, at least in the block, um, um, uh, are parameterized by a set of, let's say, dominant alcoves. Mm -hmm. So that corresponds to, um, if you want, the quotient of the affine Weyl group by the finite Weyl group or the maximal length representatives of finite Weyl group orbits in, in W hat. Mm -hmm. So you have to quotient everything which is, by everything which is not dominant. I see. And this is, so this is the antispherical quotient. Yeah. Of course, it's the antispherical quotient. Okay. Then you get an, um, an equivalent. OK, for the last 10 minutes of my, of my talk, um, I <laughs> want to tell you about my approach. This is joint work with Martina Lanini. Um, so I, I hope that I convinced you, especially with this beautiful <coughs> video of Jody, that there's something going on that where, where, we have an, where, where we have a chance to understand something. I mean, this is not chaotic, this billiard thing, right? So, um, there's, there's a combinatorics going on. So it's not arbitrary what the characters are, but there's something to understand mathematically. But what I, I would like to advocate is that um, we have to think in a different direction, namely, um, the problem is that once you do calculations, you're always surprised what, what kind of exceptional primes appear. Right, I mean, you, you do something and you get the matrix and then there are some minors and you see, okay, well, 17 is an exceptional prime for this situation or whatever. But we would like to predict it. But in order to predict primes, we have to have some discrete or arithmetic background in the, in the theory. So, um, so I, I would like, and I cannot make this precise, to discretize everything. Um, I would like to see a lattice or, you know, some arithmetic appearing. And um, one approach, one of, maybe not, it's not the only approach, is, is sheaves and alcoves. Uh, okay, so let me very, be very quick. A is the set of alcoves. So, um, so the connected components, if you remove all these, um, all these um, hyperplanes, this is the set of alcoves, and there's a partial order. So um, the partial order is generated by the following. So the alcove A should be smaller than the alcove S alpha N, 
a if if a is on the negative side um, of of the hyperplane, so uh, this contains in all weights that um, um, mu alpha check smaller than than n. So if a is on the negative side, it should be smaller. This is um, the semi-infinite order on the alcoves that nothing to do with the Brouillard order. And this makes A into a topological space. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I would like, um, so these are the parameters. But I would like to have a theory, you know, on a on a discrete set, in a sense, you know, on a, I, I can make it very precise. Maybe you get an, so what I, what I want to say, but this is, would be a too strong statement, is that um, I kind of think looking at geometry, um, I, no, I don't want to say that. I mean, I don't know where the solution is, but I'm particularly not looking at geometry. Geometry in the you know complex manifolds or varieties or something. I, I, I like to uh, see the primes appear in a more discrete setup, okay. like these alcoves. I mean, this is a kind of discrete set, and you, for example, you can you can um, calculate length, distances between alcoves and so. Um, so this is a topological space. So we need, um, um, yeah, topological space. So the open subsets is, are the order ideals with respect to this. So a subset is open. If it um, contains any weight lambda, then it also contains everything that is smaller than lambda. <coughs> so then we need um, algebra. So this is the, yeah, let's be, let's, yeah. Um, so on this space A, um, acts the, um, the root lattice, translations of, um, I ignore the P uh, here, uh, acts the, um, the root lattice, and um, let's define V to be, the, to be the quotient. So into this situation, there's, um, um, there's an algebra connect, um, associated. Um, so it's defined as follows. So um, it's inside a product over all elements in this, in this quotient of the symmetric algebra of the co-root lattice tensor k. So the k vector space associated to the co-root lattice. And the relations that cut out this algebra are, um, are the following. So Zw should be equivalent to C S alpha w modulo alpha check for all w and v and for all roots alpha. So the finite Weyl group still acts on this uh, on this quotient, and um, so this cuts out this algebra. And um, now I'm looking at sheaves in the most ordinary sense. I mean, honest sheaves on a uh, on a topological space. On this um, on this topological space A, uh, so they should have two. Con they should satisfy two, mainly two um, com um, conditions. One that uh, we call the support condition. And let me stress again, this is joined with Martina Lanini. The support condition. You see, um, this algebra is kind of. Uh, um, constructed out of this uh, set of alcoves, um, but a sheaf of C modules, um, we, we have to connect this definition kind of to, to the alcoves. Um, so if you have a sheaf F, um, then you can, and, and you have a, an X in, um, in this quotient, you can specialize F in two ways on, on the corresponding orbit. So X is an orbit in A, and there's a topological restriction, but there's also an algebraic restriction using this algebra. So f upper x is, um, um, is 
Sx tensor Z F. So Sx is the, the S module of rank one on which such an element acts as multiplication with Cx. So you can specialize this algebraic stock of this sheaf, but you can also um, so you can also embed the orbit x in in the in the space of alcoves and do push pull back push forward in the sense of sheaves. So um, then the support condition just means um, that f x is equivalent to um, so we have to push forward. after pulling back fx, and this should be an isomorphism. So this, if um, f satisfies the support condition, if these two localizations uh, hold, and the second is a base change condition. It roughly says if T is a localization of S, then there's two things we can do with the um, with the sheaf. We can actually refine um, this um, this um, topology um, by um, by allowing more open sets um, using this localization, and we can also, of course, um, base change the the sheaf to um, coefficients in um, in T. And uh, so this gives a, I spare you the details, this gives a base change functor um, f goes to f box tensor s t. A little technical, that's what, yeah, I spare you this definition. And the base, uh, the, the base change condition is that this stays a sheaf instead of a pre-sheaf, merely pre-sheaf, it's a sheaf for all t. So after base change, these objects stay sheaves, not only pre-sheaves. So um, the theorem. So first, let's say um, C is the category of sheaves satisfying both conditions. Then, for, um, so um, for, uh, for all alpha and and in the C, there's a unique in decomposable projective. P A in and Z with um, that contains A in the support and the support is contained in everything that is smaller or equal to A. So yeah, I mean every um, so and then this can be okay. Let let me ignore the, the grading. This pain can be graded as well. And second, um, the rank of the restriction to, to an alcove B. So IB is the inclusion of an alcove in, in A of PA um, is the multiplicity of the, uh, um, of the simple representation. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, So this is the baby Verma module. For the Lie algebra of G, and this is a simple for the Lie algebra. Or for G1 T better. So um, these, these ranks of these projectives, they encode representation theoretic data, namely inside a, a category of representations of uh, the Lie algebra of 
G or G1T modules. I think we hear more about G1T modules in, a, in the next talk. Um, <coughs> and uh, these multiplicities in turn determine the uh, characters of the simple representations again. So um, these determine <coughs> the simple representations for like the characters of the simple representations for G. So you can encode um, the, the character problem inside these, um, this sheaf theory. And this is one way to kind of find something which is more discrete, where you can maybe um, topologically see primes popping up. But that's, that's the point we are at now. I can't, I can't say anything more specific. Thank you very much.